This is the light which shall give revelation to the Gentiles. The mystery of God in the world for the salvation of the world. Hey everybody, how is it going? My name is Jordan Pacheco. And I'm Rudy Carlos. It has been far too long since we've been side by side on the channel, Rudy, but we have been side by side at your job on Guadalupe Radio. So I guess it's I guess it's OK. <laughs> That's true. That is true. Yeah. The last time we did something together was uh, was uh, when my boss went out for a, a vacation or no, it was a retreat. Excuse me. Yeah. And uh, so I had you come on and help me out because uh, it's very hard to run the radio station while everybody else is gone. So I, I appreciate you doing that for me, brother. Well, I mean, it was nice that the Glad Trad podcast for a brief moment in history was essentially syndicated on the air. We were syndicated in over 50 different radio stations all over the United States. Dude, that's crazy. So, I never I never think about how how big y'all are at. So it looks like people people know you from all over the place now. How exciting. I don't think so. I run into that. <laughs> so I did. Somebody commented um, on uh, one of our videos. Oh, I think I saw you at my parish in Houston. And uh, I haven't been to that parish in a while. But uh -huh. <laughs> that's the first time that's ever happened. No. Nick Cavazos, our good friend over at the traditional Thomas, he gets recognized all the time. So it uh, must be nice. The, the Just Catholic, remember us little people. You know? that's, that's right. You know, the Catholic world is a small world. That's what I'm discovering, which is kind of cool, you know. Like apparently yeah. there was a guy who came up to my, so my T.O. is a deacon uh, in, in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. And someone came up oh, to him okay. and was like, hey, um, is your, is Jordan Pacheco your nephew? Cause I listened to like <laughs> his show. He was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I know. Oh, weird dude. Hey, how are you like, how are you like in Texas? You, you a full, you a full Texan, Texican yet? Well, no, it's incredibly hard to get your Texan documents here. If that makes sense. So um, trying to figure out how to make that work. I, I, I won't consider myself a Texan until I get my Texas license. Yeah. So my driver's license. So we'll see. That's in the works. And, uh, you know, I'm liking Texas a lot better now. I, you know, I'm getting pretty used to the uh, the schedule, the routine, mm. uh, getting up really early. I get up around 3, 4. 34 four ish every day to to go into the radio station and it's a lot of prep time you know a lot of people think you know you wake up you roll into the studio no we well i i do the news i pull stories every night and do copy i write copy for the stories that i'm pulling uh, so it's a lot of work but uh, very rewarding and uh, i get out of the studio at around noon time so the rest of the day i'm hanging out with my my beloved and my my daughter and doing all kinds of stuff you know around the house so it's very fun how are, how are you doing jordan and i'm doing fine it's it's also a roller coaster you know more more death and dying uh which coming from from work which is really cool we just got done with a shoot um by the way happy uh easter friday Friday after Happy Easter. Easter. Did you have meat today, by the way? Did you eat, I was going to say, did you eat meat? Yeah, man. I had some uh, steak and shake for the first time since Burbank. <laughs> oh, that sounds good. Yeah, uh, donut, uh, yeah I had uh, had a taco today with steak. Whoa, in it. man, you are in but, Texas. Uh, <laughs> everything else was uh, vegetarian. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not, you know, so yeah, work is work is going good. You know, home life's going fine. We're just we're just we're just, we're just surviving a little bit. My, my lease is up next month and my rent gets raised Ooh. because of course it does so dang whatever. it i know i another year and i think we'll have we'll have enough capital to like buy something with equity but i'm really wow. hoping everyone's dead in the war will have happened at that point so i can get a really nice property for cheap well at that point you won't have to pay for it <laughs> oh that's actually true you know i i i don't believe in squatting squatting and squatters rights mm. but i'm not gonna lie some of those people make out like bandits don't they Oh yeah, one of my neighbors got evicted for doing that. Um, they just posted up, and never paid rent. I guess um, was there like an yeah, eviction? Wasn't their priority, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's oh. just how it is. You were also fixing uh, uh, your car, your car lock. Yeah, you heard. Oh man, yeah, you heard that story. So I, I feel like if I live next to you, I'd, I'd feel more confident about these things. But oh, I would have helped you. I know, I know. And I had, I had a buddy help me, but I was just like, man, dude, Rudy probably knows all this crap because you are, you are a crack mechanic <laughs> in your own. You're like the perfect Mr. Uh, Fixing when it comes to like cars and like the family motorcade, all that jazz. Yeah. Until you run into something you don't know how to fix. And right. And it's like something, all your cred, all your cred just goes out the window. Something the wife YouTube doesn't trust can't you even anymore. You from. Right. Well, I told Jen, so I came in the first, <laughs> I came in from the first attempt and it didn't work. Right. And as a man, especially like, 
you go out to do something like this. And I came back and I was just feeling dejected. And yeah, Jen gave me a hug. Me can't figure it out. Yeah, man. Jen gave me a hug and she was like, why don't you just take it back into the shop? And I was like, no. It's like the no. shop didn't fix it the first time. I remember I was driving to Tenebrae that night and I was like, I called my dad. I was like, I'm just going to sell this stupid thing. I hate, I hate this car. I hate this Civic. I hate it. Oh, man. All right. You got a lemon? No, it's not a lemon. I mean, there's, there's, um, there's still some things to fix. I'm, easy thing. I just have to change my rear brake pads probably the next couple of weeks. I can do that in my sleep. The AC went out, though, after I got it pretty soon last summer. And so I have to Dang. just see if it's a charge or if it's a if it's just completely on the fritz. I'm yeah, hoping or, leak it, or something. Yeah. I don't know. That's the thing. I don't know anything about air conditioning in cars. Right. But there is a YouTube channel that uh, knows these things. So I just got to know what I'm talking about. Probably going to get it diagnosed at the shop still. But, you know, if I can fix it, I'm going to try to fix it. Yeah, there's always a YouTube channel out there. I was talking about this with my my coworker, Adrian Fonseca. Um, He's got a podcast called Catholic Conversations. You should mm-hmm. check it out. Um, but he was talking about, you know, fixing things. He was trying to fix a bike or something like that. And he's like, I'm just, you know, that's the thing when you don't know how to fix things. And I said, look, just go on YouTube, man. There's a video for everything. Yeah. I didn't know. I mean, this, this is an ingrained knowledge for me. <laughs> like I go on YouTube <laughs> and figure it out. <laughs> Isn't it crazy to think like what the world before YouTube looked like? Oh, you'd have to be an expert. Right. Or you'd have to know someone who's an expert, or at least you'd have <laughs> yeah. to have a lot of time to try. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right. So, so listen, I um, I had a work coworker uh, at work today. This is kind of what spurred on this conversation, but I think we've been wanting to talk about this for a while. He comes to me and he mm-hmm. says, "You know, listen, I listened to this podcast a little bit, and they were just talking about rad trads." And he joshes me a little bit, Jordan. You're such a rad trad, and he doesn't really mean it, and I'm not. I would say, but. Yeah. I was like, well, what makes me a rat chat? And he's like, you know, like people who just think like, oh, you know, it's like, it's your, he said, he started by saying this. He said, Catholics who think that just because other Catholics go to the Norse Ordo, they're not Catholics. And I was like, okay. wait, that's me? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <All right. laughs> I, uh, uh, and so my point is this, I, I hear this a lot and not just from kind of obscure podcasts. I listened to this particular episode that he was um, listening to, I'm not going to name drop the podcast. It's not that big of a deal. Um, yeah, not like not like the old, like the podcast is flip it. I just don't think that it's a very as we'll get into. I don't think it's a very valid point, even what they were kind of making. Um, but what I noticed with a lot of different peoples who aren't maybe inside traditional Catholicism, let's say, is that there is this this natural stereotype that to be a traditional Catholic is to be a, a rad trad or a mad trad. And this means that you're an extremely scrupulous person who, if if someone doesn't attend a lot in mass or if someone prays the luminous mysteries or or whatever have it, that they're actually bad people, that um, mm. the rad trads are so dogmatist and so legalistic that there's absolutely no room for any sort of variation. And um, I think we'll get into this because I've noticed that a lot of times that argument doesn't actually address nearly anything that a lot of traditional Catholics are actually critical or maybe just questioning about Mm -hmm. the idea that for some strange reason, if you have maybe uh, expressed doubts about some of the words in the documents that say the Second Vatican Council, if you have critiques about the new mass, as we both do, as Nick does on his podcast, there's a whole breakdown, right? Introductory critique of the Norse Ordo. the sacraments we have all these cases nowadays where like people wake up and they're not actually baptized because they yeah. didn't use the actual rubrics right so i just want to kind of get your thoughts maybe your experience a little bit because i even remember that when i became a trad rudy one of my one of my fond stories of you is that you were worried for me because you thought that i at that time i went to the was going to with the the dread society of pope pius the 10th <laughs> and <laughs> now i'll never live that down that's huh? funny it's but it's it's, it's it represents both of our developments so well you know because even we were like well we're not we're not that surely we're not that crazy we're not you know whatever crazy <laughs> meant to us at the time right because we thought they were set of a contest yeah. and all this other kind of dumb stuff well it certainly is one of those those comments it's very brazen i think to say uh, to paint us with a broad stroke the way that people do uh, traditionalists um 
they paint us as a, a type of Pharisee even. You know, they compare us to the Pharisees who believed that they knew everything. They could not be taught by even our blessed Lord. Um, and I think it's just a very false equivocation. I, I think I think that this this sort of broad way of painting us is uh, is something that we tend to not do on the other side. Um, for example, we can have our critique about the new mass, but the regular person who leans traditional isn't going into it saying things like, well, if you go to the, to the Novus Ordo, that means you're not Catholic. That's just not, that's not what the majority of people think. And I, I'm sure we'll get into this particular thing, but I just, I, 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 it reminds me of a story. It reminds me of, of something that happened to me recently. I'm doing my very best to, uh, to live out this, this 40 days plus of penance of Lent in preparation for Easter. And believe me, here in Houston, there's been definite challenges for us. And so it does feel like a desert for us. It, at least it did uh, during this Lent is what I mean to say. And I remember going on onto Twitter. It was the only social media that uh, I kept because I decided, you know, I'm wasting a lot of time on social media. And um, the other thing I gave up, if you watched one of the videos that I posted, was I, I gave up having sweets. Mm -hmm. But social media was also something I gave up. I didn't really talk about that. And so I was spending a lot of time on Twitter, as you do. When you give up Instagram, you spend all your other time on the other social media site. So you know how that works. Right. And uh, during Holy Week, this is a long way of sending, saying that during Holy Week, I was seeing a lot of different posts on Twitter. Now, this is more of a, a, of a, a philosophical um, example of, of Twitter because Twitter represents a very specific kind of traditionalist. The sort of traditionalist that I think people uh, who are maybe not leaning traditional, traditional see as the, the poster child mm -hmm. for emblematic emblematic. And, um, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm not going to throw stones at these people, but the kinds of conversations that happen there tend to be very militant. And I don't think it's their fault. I think it's the way that Twitter is set up. It's not a place for discussion. It's a place for people to go and write a comment. And oftentimes their comments are from a perspective of an authoritarian uh, uh, perspective. Like, this is this, and that's what I believe. And if you, if you go against what I believe, then X, Y, and Z, blah, blah, blah. And there's no discourse. And so... In the same way that that people see traditionalists that way, I think they're they're painting this broad they're painting traditionalists at, with a broad stroke and saying these poster childs, these poster children rather, are the ones who represent tradition, and they're militant, and they're mean, and they think they got it all figured out, and they said I'm not Catholic, but maybe just maybe those aren't the people that truly represent what tradition means. And I, I'm sure, I mean, this is something that we're trying to unravel in this podcast. Like, what does it mean to be a traditionalist? What mm. does it look like? Um, is, it, is it being glum? Is it being happy? Is it being whatever? Is it being militant? Yeah, sure, there's aspects of all of those different things. But I hate being painted with a broad brush. And what's interesting is... <laughs> Trads are people too. I mean, that's the only way I'd really say it. Trads are people too. Yeah. But I find, I find that with internet discourse, and we know this, it's, it is about people who have more of a dogmatic position, quote unquote, statements that seem more inflammatory or maybe just more, thin, as you said, authoritative, those tend to rise to the top. It's mm -hmm. about emotion. It's not, you know, there are, of course, these spaces are, are, you know, I don't quite know if our podcast is like social media, right, per se, but like there are obviously mm. spaces where we do have discourse, where we do have discussions, where we do have nuances. I, I think long form podcasting is a great example of that. Um, yeah. Obviously, 150 characters. Is it on Twitter? 150, 120, something like that. I think that. it's still 150. Right. I deleted the app, by the way. I, hey, I'm not on, on Twitter yeah. anymore. Right. Well, so, we, uh, we, we thought when we started this podcast, it was very funny, right? Because we have a Twitter technically and we just use it to really 
post episodes um and also yeah, we so we can like sure see kind of tribes right. right but we were like catholic twitter is a cesspool we'll be the first to admit it and a lot of of the nuance or the elegance or perhaps even the correctiveness of a discussion gets lost because in a very short amount of time you don't have the chance to explain why you figure um there might be a problem with pope francis or there might be a problem with the mass or there might be a problem with the post Fifty Five holy week whatever it is uh, this cream rises to the top. And unfortunately, I think for even a lot of Catholics who I'm very fond of their their opinions and their thoughts in their other formats, such as podcasting, such as their videos, mm. I go to their their Twitter pages and I get disappointed because I think it's very easy and fun and emotionally stimulating to get lost in the rigmarole of, of the gutter fights that happen on social media. Um, I will say this. I think that a lot of critiques against traditional Catholics again, are not so much about the issues they bring up because they're not addressed properly, I would say. It points to the people without actually experiencing the people firsthand. So we've gone with the fraternity and the society and the Institute of Christ the King, and these are just normal people trying to live their lives, right? Trads will still drink beers and talk about the game, and they might have a funny little joke or two. Um, And it's interesting because I think that a lot of people on the outside looking in don't know where to begin, right? They they think that Taylor Marshall's is head of a contest. They think that um, anyone who has a critique against Pope Francis, they're still trapped in this ultra montanistic kind of phrase. Um, not all of them, obviously, but there are some commentators who who have critiques on tradition that I'm always very surprised at. Will sometimes resort back to sort of ultra montanist position, even if they don't acknowledge it. Where the Pope is a rock star, right? Oh, we're still under a, a Benedict or a JP two, and like whatever the Pope says, oh, it must be must be the case, right? And so what I've discovered in my own discourses is, is I'll say something like this: I'll say, um, I don't know enough about, um, I don't know enough about Pope John Paul II, let's say, to to completely like put him as like one of the worst popes in history. Right? I think that there's way more cans of worms that I personally am more attracted to. But a CC happened, and I think the ecumenism of that sort is a huge problem, is a sin against the first commandment. And the reason why I, I find it to be is because they placed the statue of Buddha on a tabernacle. So I've had a very, very clear example of a critique I have against, against a pope who is immensely popular. And oftentimes the reaction I get back from that is not a defense of a CC and not a defense of Pope John Paul II in that action in particular. It's actually more just confusion. What's a CC, right? And then when I explain it, it's not like, oh, I don't believe he did that because it's out there. It's like, well, he wasn't perfect, which again, like that's a conversation to have. You know, I don't expect every Pope, even the ones I like to be perfect <laughs> per se. Um, but isn't that a very different kind of strain than just thinking that I've come off as just hating any Pope that existed after uh, St. Pius X or something like that? Yeah, the nuance has been lost in not just the discourse of between traditionalists and non-traditionalists or new people coming into the church. I think that discourse, the nuance in discourse has been lost just generally speaking. Um, And that's why I brought up that social media example, because social media tends to be like that, you know. Um, but, um, But to speak to a point you just mentioned, you know, the other thing that we run into, and I'm sure maybe they're they're basing their their podcast on this sort of sort of experience, which tends to be pretty common. It's the it's the the type of person who creates their own magisterium. And what do I mean by that? I mean that for this person, I think they they might be suffering from a sort of uh, scrupulosity. So I'll give you an example. I'm not going to name the person, but this person made an example of uh, of fasting. And uh, fasting, you know, fasting is good. You should fast. Mm -hmm. It's uh, good for your soul. It's good for your body. Uh, You rein in all of your passions. You submit submit your passions to your intellect. It's fantastic things, you know. But we got talking about um, the Eucharistic fast. And if you're not familiar with what that is, 
of Eucharistic fast is a, an amount of time where you do not receive or take in any sort of uh, food. Sometimes people don't drink anything uh, besides water, but there's hardcore people, and this was more in the past, um, that would not even drink water. And that's, I mean, that's a very deep spiritual practice. Uh, it's it's a good thing. I don't think that's part of it now. And the reason we got onto this topic is because I said, I don't think, I think if, if you look in the catechism, that you could take black coffee and that does not affect your Eucharistic fast. And then later on in the conversation, this person mentioned that there was a story of somebody who was brushing their teeth and they accidentally swallowed toothpaste and they weren't able to receive Holy Communion because they said that they broke their Eucharistic fast. And I said, wait a minute, the person swallowed the toothpaste accidentally? I mean, that's not like they did that on purpose. He said, no, I'm not being scrupulous. That is a breaking of the fast. And I said, I, I mean, this is the kind of weeds that we get into. So there is a sort of credence to what they're saying. I don't agree with everything that they're saying, but I have encountered people yeah. That have these sorts of takes, magisterial takes that are are off putting, and so with the loss of nuance, there's also been a loss of tact in the way that we approach these conversations. Mm. I'll be the first one to admit it. Um, there, there is, and to go back to what you said, there is an emotional appeal in most of the the, the statements that we make these days, and so we can't forget that. And um, we can't we can't pretend that's not part of our discourse. You know, we make these emotional appeals, but we have to remember tact. Are we looking at this situation of uh, of the salvation of souls the same way? I think so. I mm -hmm. think we owe we owe people the benefit of the doubt. And traditionalists, I think, real traditionalists are looking at it from the perspective of saving souls. They want more souls into the church. What do uh, non-traditionalists talk, talk about? What well, they talk about the renovation of the church. They talk about renewal in in the spirit of the of the laity. I mean, those are fairly similar concepts. I think we're moving towards the same thing, which is the salvation of souls. We want people to encounter Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, how do we do that if the first conversation we have is, uh, well, you know, uh, if you if you do this X, Y, and Z, that means that X, Y, and Z, and it's very militant. Is there a moment to do these to have these conversations? Yeah, I think so. But uh, we have to remember nuance. We have to remember uh, uh, this this tact in the way that we approach the situation. We have to take a step back and look at how much ground has been lost in the church and in the discourse and in just the practices of the faith in order to kind of understand why I think a lot of people will label rad trads as rad trads. So a lot of people who are in the traditional Catholic movement weren't born there. It's kind of cool to see that there are now generations of those who are more commonly, but for you and for me, that was not our experience. And mm -hmm. so we came from the wreckages of the, the springtime of the new evangelization. We came from the wreckages of, in some cases, the worst of the new mass. We came from wreckages of losing the understanding of the first law of the church, which is the salvation of souls. I remember even being in confirmation and I knew that the Catholic church was true. I believed it, I accepted it. And I had also heard extra ecclesia. And I was really thinking about that because I didn't see that evident in my practice of Catholicism at the time as a, as a boy. It just didn't seem to me like Catholicism was something that was so suddenly unique that you needed to be Catholic for the sake of salvation. Invincible ignorance and the proper understanding, of course, put on aside. So, of course, there are actual traditionalists, which I would say are radical. Um, Feniites are a perfect example of this, um, to where there is not even really a baptism of desire, baptism of fire. And so it's kind of funny to read. You read Archbishop Lefebvre, who is extremely orthodox, obviously, and he makes it very clear that there is a church case for invincible ignorance, which is defined. So we don't have, mm. you know, there isn't a sort of confusion there. Um, Catholics, I think one of the things that we have is people say, well, what happens to like aborted babies? And of course, we, we don't know. Um, we, we have ideas, of course, but is it is it fair to say, well, they're not baptized and therefore, 
all all things in God's way, but we also know that there is possible to be saved. God works outside of the sacraments. This is an obvious blueprint. He saves Dismas on the cross. Dismas was not baptized. He had not received the Eucharist. He looked upon God and said, remember me when you come into thy, uh, into thy kingdom. And Christ said, this day will be with me in paradise. So we know that God exists outside the sacraments. We know that he's greater, that, that his justice and his mercy are one. And it's a more than just smells and bells. And if you sit there and you were to go with a traditionalist parish for a month or two months and you listen to the homilies, I think people would be very surprised about how much time of the homily is not focused upon the externals. It is, it is so predominantly about the internals, your disposition, your charity, your soul, your salvation. And I think this is one of the reasons why in trad parishes, generally speaking, the lines for confession tend to be pretty gosh darn long. You would think that people who are extremely smug, prideful, and self-righteous wouldn't have a need for such a thing because we're already so holy. Um, but I find that that going to the traditional Latin Mass for me has opened up my own weaknesses as a human being, has made me understand deeper the need for confession and the need for the Eucharist and the need for adoration. Um, so I'm, I'm always trying to kind of take people a step back because in this lost territory, there are certain practices between the new mass and the new theology and the old mass and and more set forms of theology in the church, which look night and day different. And Chesterton talks about how um, tradition is the democracy of the dead. And my question always to people is this for people levering these weird critiques that say Trent or antiquarianism or something, you know, um, which one of these peoples would probably understand their ancestors a little bit more? My joke is always the the churches that have their saint names all around. If that saint was alive today and came and, you know, participated in the mass there, what would they actually believe about the mass? Would they say, oh, yeah, this is the mass of the ages, no problem. Would they leave being like, why are people clearly not believing this thing that I may have fought and died for myself? And then it brings up a very interesting question, which is that I think that the the trad position has been hijacked in a way. So if we were both in the 60s, let's say, we would we would have gone to the Latin mass. That would have been the mass of the Roman rite. And can you imagine if they suddenly came to you and said, well, hey, there's this newfangled mass and this new theology and these new sacraments. And uh, all of a sudden, by the way, that's 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 the orthodoxy. And if you believe if you have any even questions about why the heck did this stuff change and should we not talk about this? Ah, you're just being radical. You know, it wasn't it, apparently it was radical to stay the same. Right. It wasn't radical to change whatsoever. That was actually the, the good thing to do. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's that's such a fascinating thing to to uh, think about, because that's exactly what happened to Archbishop Lefebvre. One priest who who was so so holy so so in tune with the idea with the concept with the with the reality that there were souls at stake so much so that he goes to africa and he he founds all these different missions and he goes and for the love of souls and then you know he's, he's doing it the the old-fashioned way and then all of a sudden later on it turns out that well they don't like the way that he's doing things. The people that he went to seminary with, that he 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 grew up with, that were celebrating the old sacraments, all of a sudden shifted and they said, "No, you're doing it the wrong way. How could it how could it be wrong if we all did this for so long?" You know, I I uh I, we had a a great opportunity to talk to uh, Al, his name is Dom Alcuin Reed who is a prior um, and very, he's very well-spoken on tradition. We talked to him about tradition and he, he was telling us about these developments. Everything about tradition has been organic. Everything, everything is organic. You know, the people live out a certain way and it gets adopted into the liturgy. You know, that's how, that's how the liturgy was formed over these 2000 years. Mm -hmm. Um, and I asked him, I said, Dom, is there, was there any other example in history where the liturgy was changed so abruptly as it was after the council with the mass of Paul VI? 
there has never been an example of a change this drastic. And that's something that, uh, that seldom ever gets talked about because we get lost in the weeds of all of these different things, all these different topics, uh, where we can't, we can't have a, a decent conversation or a critique about the new mass. And I'll be the first one to tell you, dear listener, I, I have critiques of the new mass. I will be upfront with you and I'll say, I will never go to the new mass ever again. And that might sound to you as extreme, but there are many, many different reasons as to why I've come to that decision. I wasn't always a traditionalist, just like you, Jordan. We're, we're talking about that just a, a few minutes ago. Um, we didn't, we didn't come from tradition. We came from the Nova Soto. We came from the new mass and we weren't being fed. We, we needed to go and find something, anything. I mean, I was even ready to go Eastern, you know, anything to feed our souls because why there's, there's definitely a void there. And, uh, and most people experience the new mass and they fall away. That was one of the sad things mm -hmm. about being so involved at my old parish. It was a Nova Sordo parish. Uh, one of my responsibilities was to teach uh, young uh, high school kids about the faith. And I always struggled with this, this statistic that almost 80% of those kids would not return to mass. Why is that? And that was something I could never square, Jordan. It was, it was, I was thinking, well, I've fallen in love with, with Christ. I've fallen in love with the Eucharist. I've, I've fallen in love with our faith. I'm teaching it the best way I can. I'm trying to to reveal the truth of the mass, the truth of our 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 Catholic faith. And yet I can see it in real time. This is not affecting them whatsoever. Why is that? It's because everything that we have been taught, everything that we teach sort of unravels with the new mass. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I'll be the first one to tell you, you know, I just, I don't like the new mass. I will never go there. I wouldn't take my daughter there, but there's a conversation to be had about it. Right. I mean, you probably, if you were going into, uh, into this, this podcast thinking, well, traditionalism is bad, you know, you're probably coming from the perspective of going to the Nova Sordo and that, that seems to you as very off-putting, but have we ever had this conversation before? Have we ever talked about how the, the liturgy that changed organically all of a sudden was abruptly changed in the 60s and how that's not normal and that's, that's some, that should be a red flag? I don't think most people have that conversation. I find that there's, there's been an adoption of a truth again or a lie against human nature when it comes to why things have changed so radically. And the reason is because you will get down to within the writings of, of the Council Fathers, the aftermath of the Second Vatican Council. And of course, this has existed prior to the Council, but we, we know this is the magnum opus. You can see our, our, we had a really fun show with Nick on his channel talking about, yeah. it's, our, it's our Archbishop Lefebvre part two, where we really go through the documents of the Second Vatican Council and some of the key players. Um, I will link it, I'll put a thing up there. Please check it out, it's very good. But there's this idea of, of two general camps. Number one is that human beings created in the image and likeness of God have a nature which does not change. And in fact, the only ways you could say it does change would, of course, be the infusion of God in something like the sacraments, right? Where, uh, where so radical is our original sin washed away that we are made a new wineskin. Then there's a second philosophy which says that humans actually have developed over time and that we have become angels of our better nature. And because humans change, everything has to change with them. So this philosophy would say that there is no stock in something like some of the biblical texts because this was written 2000 years ago by people who did not understand the way that the world worked and therefore they didn't understand this. This is the philosophy that says that Trent was nice, but Trent was reactionary. It was a frozen council in a frozen time and place. And therefore, it ought not be really 
looked at as, even if it is dogmatically authoritative, that ought not to be looked at with any sort of authority. This is the same with the Latin mass, right? These people will say something like, the problem with the Latin mass is that it's incomprehensible. I don't speak Latin. You don't speak Latin. So how is the man in the pew, I know, so you know, stop me if you've heard this one before. How is the man in the pew supposed to understand it? How is he supposed to develop a relationship with God in a language that he doesn't understand? And I would say that the counter argument, the argument that traditionalists make in regards to that versus the new mass, because the new mass is therefore put on this pedestal as it's it's comprehensible. You can understand every part of it. It's so easy to follow along. It brings us therefore closer to God in the Eucharist and then sends us forth in greater light. My argument first is one of history, which is that it seems strange that the church for 2000 years and not just the Latin church, not just the Roman rite of the church, but all the different rites of the church have been celebrating their liturgies for a very long time and have converted a lot of people doing it. So the idea that just because a predominance of a population doesn't speak, say, the language of the liturgy, I think actually adds to its value inherently. And this is why. Um, Mexico, I'll give the easy example, right? After the terrors of the Protestant Reformation, what happens? Our Lady of Guadalupe appears to a peasant, Juan Diego, and it's because it's through the workings of Our Lady there that millions of souls, an entire nation, converts over to Catholicism. That wasn't done by Spanish order, right? That was done because Our Lady triumphed in Mexico. What mass were they celebrating? Wasn't uh, it wasn't the the regular Spanish five o'clock mass? Was it, Rudy? <laughs> it was the uh, Anglican ordinariate, actually. Oh my gosh! Uh, Mexicans we... love the ordinary. Oh, they just adore. <laughs> so uh, it was. Uh, it... <laughs> It was uh, it was very unique. Oh yes, uh, very, the yeah. unique expression of the Roman rite. Uh, <laughs> so I would say I would say <laughs> I'd say that the virtue of the mass being in Latin or Greek or or there are other languages, of course, too. I'm totally cool with other rites, by the way. Totally fine with them. But I think what's interesting about this is that first off, it makes change very very difficult, right? It's very hard to change the rubrics of baptism, let's say in Latin if it's not just your predominant language. And even if it is, it's really difficult to because these things have been set in stone organically through the process of hundreds and thousands of years. They also preserve entire peoples who do not share a common tongue. If a man who speaks English and one who speaks Spanish and one that speaks Portuguese and one that speaks Tagalog and one that speaks Japanese all were to try to go together to the same mass, it would actually be easier if they all surrendered the virtue of their native tongue for the sake of the church's language, which in the Roman rite is Latin. And then the next thing I'd say is that I think that the mass in Latin or the virtue of the mass as it's celebrated in the Ursus Antiquior points actually to the deep mystery that we have about God. In the East, right, they veil, they actually cover the moment of consecration. We close the altar rails, right? We close the doors. And what we see, and, and it's the secret, right? The consecration happens not loudly, but it, it's whispered. And everyone leans in to get a glimpse of it. And what you have to realize is that implicitly what you're being told at Latin Mass is, I don't understand everything, but I must surrender my spirit. I must surrender my will to these realities that exist far beyond me. Because when God comes down to us, he condescends down to our level. Right. We're not we're not pagans. God is not Zeus sitting up there and he has the exact same human triggers, human lusts, human appetites. He is supra the entirety of the universe. And so every time God comes down to us in the Eucharist, in apparitions and in, in Christ himself, it's a condescension. It's it's the nature of God moving into the created thing itself. And that's what makes it a miracle. That's what makes it mysterious. I would say that part of the reason why we've lost reverence in the mass is because so much of the new mass is oriented towards making you feel included and welcome and warm and fuzzy. And so we lose the sacrificial mystery that's in the Latin mass. And this of course manifests in so many different ways. The fact that communion is received kneeling on the tongue in Latin mass, and there is great reverence and belief in the real presence. There isn't in the Novus Ordo, where 
You go up and I've you we've all seen it. Someone sloppily just takes or they don't take. And how nervous is it is when someone holds our Lord in their hands, they don't know what they're holding. Um, I don't know, Rudy. I mean, I think that I think that the primal fight, it's you know, to be a Trishless is more than just the mass, but of course, the mass is our most radical demonstration of God's love because it is the 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 um it is what happened on Cavalry locked in perennially all throughout the ages it is the same sacrifice Mm. you know the once and future sacrifice yeah that's true and and just think you know not even the angels get to receive our blessed lord the way that we do Mm, we get a very intimate we receive our blessed lord in a very intimate way we receive him we we gnaw on his flesh as he requested us to um yeah, there's a lot of different objections that I think non-traditionalists have with the mass. One of those things that, you know, it reminds me of this example of, you know, I'm thinking about your car. I'm thinking about your your, your car lock. You know, imagine if you went and you approached the situation without even trying to figure out how the lock worked. I mean, obviously, it's not going to work out, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to go take the lock apart. You might even damage the door trying to get it out because there's a specific way to do it. Um, and and this critique that gets lobbied against Latin in the mass, for example, is that, uh, well, I don't understand it. Well, of course you don't understand it. I, I don't understand Chinese. You know, if I wanted to understand it, I would take time and understand it. If I was around uh, Chinese, you know, maybe once a week, I would probably start to understand it a little Mm -hmm. bit more, right? Um, So this critique that that gets lobbied against the the mass is is so, I think it's so invalid. Um, Likewise, people will say, well, you know, I've heard this example. I'm sure you've heard this one too. You know, well, back in the day, you know, old ladies, they would just pray the rosary. They weren't participating in the mass. How do you know that? How how could you possibly know that? And statistics don't lie. Why is it that back in the day, almost upwards of of eighty percent people, maybe maybe even more? I mean, I don't have the the proper statistic, but the majority it wasn't it wasn't like it was today, where seventy percent mm-hmm. of the people, probably even more, don't believe in the the real presence of Christ. Why is that? It's odd, isn't it? it's it data doesn't lie to you data doesn't lie at all it's there's something there there was something about the mass why did this mass form so many saints have you ever asked that question before i mean you know i i wonder sometimes about these critiques that get lobbied against tradition you know we even see in scripture you know we have to hold fast to tradition we have to, this isn't Thessalonians, you know, uh, we hold fast to what was given to us. And uh, oftentimes we just want to throw it away for something new and mm-hmm. say, no, we can't go back. We can't do that. Why not? We're in a, a, a crisis of faith here. People are losing their souls left and right. Do we have that charity within our hearts to look at our neighbor? and see how they're destroying their soul, they're destroying their 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 chances at ever coming into the eternal beatitude. That's hard. That's hard. And I, I think when I talk about souls, I, I, I realized why people are so militant. I, you know, this is why I have sympathy for those people who 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 maybe are could take it too far. You know, on our show we have we have a viewer who uh routinely takes it too far every single morning (laughs) (laughs) and and i think about it and 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 uh you know sometimes he'll say something and i realize he's coming from this perspective there are souls that are being lost and so his response to these souls being lost and the abandonment of our bishops the abandonment of our priests uh, our hierarchy most of the time is to go extremely the other way and try and save people that way Mm. and and i have sympathy with that Mm. you know um we haven't we 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 shouldn't forget the the perilous situation that most people are in and uh so 
we have to uh, we have to find uh, very oftentimes nuanced ways to bring these people in. You know, uh, the church has, as I've said before, and somebody greater than me has ever said has said before. You know, the church has uh, shallow enough waters for a baby to swim in, and deep enough water for you to dive head first Ooh. into off a seventy five foot cliff which I have never done. <laughs> Somebody tried to get me to do it one time. There's there's videos of me at the precipice of the cliff. I Dang, can't not enough alcohol. There's no way I can't. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I, I want people to experience tradition. I want people to see what the, the type of mass that forms saints yeah. And why is the Mass so important? Well, here's why. For the average Catholic, they are encountering God hopefully more than once a week in the Mass. I mean, that's the hope, right? You, at, a, a serious Catholic is going to make time for prayer every single day. And there's no excuse for it because there's 24 hours in the day and there's so much time that we can give to meditate upon God. That's why the Rosary, I think, was given to us because in the rosary we contemplate the life of christ but let's be realistic most catholics these days they experience god one hour out of the week and how do they experience god in a very banal liturgy that is very devoid of of uh, of uh, the theological reality that christ is present that christ's sacrifice is the unbloodied sacrifice of Christ on Calvary is Calvary is is being presented to them by the sacrificer, the priest. How many people actually understand that? How many people instead go and they take it as a opportunity to hear a homily? That's not the homily isn't the the bulk of the mass, but people encounter this one hour out of the week and they go home and it doesn't affect change into their life because they don't understand. Mm -hmm. Now, when you go into a traditional mass, all of those things, which I mentioned that are mostly devoid in the, in the new mass, they're pretty obvious. They're in your face. You can understand. You understand that there's a separation between the, the laity and the priest who is the chief sacrificer. You understand the hierarchy. You understand that Christ is present, the reverence that there is there for the true presence of our blessed Lord. All of these things are important. And yes, there, there's good homilies most of the time. And those homilies have to do with how to sanctify your life. The mass is very important. And obviously traditionalism isn't just, being a traditionalist doesn't mean just going to the traditional Latin mass, but mm -hmm. it certainly helps, <laughs> right? That's, that's so true. And I think that there's a lot of, I hear criticism like this, which is that, well, Chad's, just want to go back to the good old days, the fifties, twenties. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, there's, there's something that I, I will say this to the credit. And of course, so I don't get fired. Right. But where I work, one of the things that they, <laughs> they say with evangelization is it's, it's not enough. They don't want to go back to, 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 um, to the thirties. They want, well, they won't, don't want to go back to, to the 1930s. They want to go back to the thirties. They want to go back to when Christ has just gone up and they're going to make, and the apostles are now set forth, right? They've gone from the upper room and they now have their mission to, to baptize all nations, you know, to make disciples of everybody. Traditionalism, Catholicism is this way too. No, of course, I don't want the world to wake up and it's, Pleasant Town 50s, whatever stereotype we think of, or the 20s or the 16th century, this is silly. Because Catholicism is ever on the march. We're the church militant. There's a really wonderful article, I guess it's an essay by G.K. Chesterton, where he walks into a toy shop. It's old and it's dusty, and he encounters Father Christmas. And the man's coughing and he's wheezing, and Chesterton exclaims, Oh my, you're you're dying. And uh you have Father COVID. Christmas, yeah, you have COVID. You should have put a mask on. <laughs> Father Christmas says, thank you, G.K. Chesterton. Nobody says, yes, I'm dying. And then in walks a couple of big historical figures. In comes Charles Dickens, for instance. And he, uh, Father Christmas says the same thing. Oh, I'm dying. Here comes another figure, older still. Oh, for, I'm dying, says Father Christmas. And finally, one of them says, man, you've always been dying. And 
this is a this is a, it was a really clever analogy of what the church is, what tradition does for us. The church is ever old and ever new. The Latin mass is not locked into the 20s, into the 50s, into the 19th century, into the 5th century. It is or the mass Trent. of the ages. What? Or even Trent. Ooh, or even Trent. Exactly. Oh, well, it was code of, oh, well, they invented that Trent. No, dummy. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a reason why it's called the mass of the ages. And it's amazing to me that it feels as me, a 21st century Catholic, I am connected with our ancestors across this entire 2000 year span of the faith and even older, right? We, when you look at the sacrifice of the mass, when you hear uh, how Melchizedek is mentioned in the liturgy, I, I look at the priest and I go, I completely see that line. I, I can see that line of sacrifice. And I've been at masses where I do not see that line. I didn't even hear it mentioned, I'm sure, for a really long amount of time growing up, honestly. Um, and so it's amazing to me. And yes, to be a traditional Catholic, it's more than just smells and bells. And I get very disappointed because I also feel like those that say that we're just up from a bygone era, that we just chase after smells and bells, and that's what makes us rad trads. There's such a discount in the modern era of the lack of ritualism and of effort. So to give an example, dressing up for mass, right? One of the little scrupulosities that I think are extremely important when I grew up, I learned that we, we dressed up, you know, you dress up for a job interview, you dress up when you're going out to a nice restaurant with a beautiful woman, but we dress down for the mass and people will be very charged about this. They'll, they'll feel very personally offended if you, oh, well, I don't want to go to Latin mass because then I got to wear slacks. It's like, it's like, first off, any priest is worth his salt and my parish is like this. We're not the modesty police. Um, that's what our priest jobs are. And in fact, one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in, in Latin Mass is that in West Hollywood at St. Victor's, when the fraternity was there, there were two guys who would come and they were homeless and they were roughing it. I mean, their pants were tatters, you know, you could see some hanes sticking out. I mean, these guys were rough. And um, I always thought when I saw them, I said, you know, they belong here perhaps more so than me not in the prideful, oh, I'm so holy way, but just the fact that of all places that people who are so down on their luck to be, here they are at 7 p.m. at a Latin mass in the center of, of West Hollywood. How, how beautiful is that? Um, but when you reclaim these things, it's not enough just the words of rote. You realize that, wow, if, ma if the mass is the most important moment on, on earth, where heaven and earth actually meet in a radical way, if I'm actually going to see the king of the universe, he who lords over me, if I have the means, why would I not put in the effort? Anyone that falls in yeah. love knows that the first step of love is effort. Oh my, I'm, I'm in love with my wife, which is why I never buy her flowers and I never say I love you and I never pick up the laundry, <laughs> you know, instead. Thanks, honey. Oh, you're great, right? I mean, what I kind love of- love you though. We Catholics believe radically, because it's an imprint of God. We are supposed to believe radically, deeply in sacrificial love. And so, we can have heaven for pennies, as St. Uh, Therese of Av Teresa of Avila says, by just doing little acts of love. And part of those little acts is, okay, do I really want to wear a tie in, in um, Colorado heat today? No, not really. But you know what? I'm going to do it, Lord. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll learn to do it joyfully because I realize what you've done for me. And if I can recognize that, then it's not, a, it's not an inconvenience. And it makes the joy of being able to feel the air in your collar all the more worthwhile. <laughs> after the fact <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a, that's a very another common um you know critique well i have to dress up well of course you have to dress up why you know you? You why why wouldn't you you dress up for a date you dress up for a job interview as i said you dress up for all kinds of different things but you won't dress up for the king of the universe really well, what you say to this, Rudy, you'll hear this, that people say, well, Jesus says, come as you are. So he doesn't really, he doesn't really care. So did Kurt Cobain. <laughs> and in fact, Look he said a little trendier. Oh, mm. <laughs> yeah. mm. oh my gosh. <laughs> come as you are. Of course. Of course. You, you, you go, you go, and then you, you realize once you, you fall in love that uh, there is a better way of doing things. I mean, think about um, 
think about uh you know a young man falling in love with a woman of course he's going to go out of his way to try and figure out ways to uh to impress this woman to to court this woman to get to know her better it's the same way with going to mass and 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 going as you are i've seen people in flip flops i've seen people in all kinds of different things that i personally don't think are appropriate for a temple of god or even for the dignity of the the person be it a man or a woman you know like ill-fitting clothing or overly revealing clothing those mm -hmm. sorts of things um but they go and they find out that people dress up and they understand they, they begin to understand why they do it and it makes sense to them this is a reasonable thing i don't think it's unreasonable to say you should wear a tie and a coat if you're a man to go to mass you shouldn't probably go in your uh sports jersey you know like that's right probably inappropriate you know but that comes with time and i think the critique that gets lobbied is you know if you go in there and you go as you are as they say immediately you're going to get kicked out or everybody's going to stare at you or whatever and if they do so what right so what you're there for something else you're not there to to have the the uh, you know to please everybody it's just not i don't think people actually care about that as much as they think i also want to point out just kind of a funny thing i've discovered with just daily lot and mass right is that people come on like their lunch break with like daily yeah. mass and and it's like so yes congratulations i've seen a lot of trads and pants like uh, jeans i mean uh <laughs> I've and, seen a painter in a jumpsuit right. before. <laughs> and it feels, and it's funny because at that moment too, it feels extremely appropriate. You're like, wow, out of your day, you're making this time to be with our Lord, to come to mass before we have to be sent out again and, and finish our day and everything. So yes, you know, on Sundays, this is the Lord's day and we have time of preparation and we should take that ritual meaningfully. Rudy talked, you talked a little bit earlier about the Eucharistic fast. And, you know, I say generally I do a midnight fast. And the reason why isn't because of some desire to be more pious on my fast. And honestly, it's just actually convenient. I just skip breakfast. Makes life, you know, <laughs> so I wish I was that cool. But, you know, you'll hear people say, well, you know, you have to, the law in the church right now is you have to fast at least an hour before mass. A lot of traditional Catholics will, will generally tend towards a three hour fast or a midnight fast. But again, what's interesting about falling deeper in love with tradition and falling into our faith is that I think there's more room to ask, why is this the way that something is? And we discover like we're just, again, setting ourselves aside. The first nourishment that we receive of the day is our Lord. He's not bracketed in these times of preparation by meals and by me preparing in other ways, by me being distracted by my own wants, right, my own urges for food. And so that's something very powerful. That's something very beautiful about that. Um, and that leads to just another critique I'd like us to kind of go over, which is that you'll hear this, Reedy. Well, trads are not, they're not evangelistic. They're circle the wagon kind of people. They're, they can be very hateful, very spiteful, uh, very, judge, very judgmental people. And that's the problem with you trads is that meanwhile, and thank God for the Second Vatican Council, the new mass, because now we've learned that we're in a springtime of the new evangelization and that we love everybody and we invite to, we eat with sinners, right? And we invite Buddhists to our temples and to our, to our, um, to our churches. And what would you have to, what would you say to that sort of thing? You know, it's, uh, what brings to mind is what happened to the missions? Why do they look so different than what they look like back in the day? where has that zeal for souls gone where instead of leading them to a conversion which is actually true evangelization we instead quote meet them where they are and and let me let me nuance that a little bit of course we have to meet people where they are but the temptation now these days is to leave them where they are to create a false equivocation between different religions and the true religion, which is in Jesus Christ, the Catholic Church. Catholicism is true. It's true because Jesus founded the church. Jesus gave us the sacraments. Jesus gave us the, all of the basic roadmaps for us to save our soul. 
he told us to go out, or rather he told the apostles, go out and, and make disciples of every nation. Well, what do we do now? Do we do that? I think we have to take a very serious look at the way that we do. There's examples of, uh, you know, in the Amazon, uh, uh, I believe a bishop, he's a bishop or at the very least a priest who boasted that he had not made any conversions and the whole time that he was in the Amazon, almost over 25 years, maybe 60 years. I, I don't remember the statistic, but ev evangelization is gone and we pretend as if it's still happening. No, it's not as active as people think it is. And it's true that people come into the church, you know, they come in, praise be to God, they come in every, every Easter or different times of the year but um, how many of them remain? How many of them end up being part of the statistic? They don't understand their faith. I was misformed when I went through RCIA. It's, uh, it's, I mean, it's, you know, it's a critique. I don't think that that stands up to the scrutiny of data. I've always grown up and I believed that the faith was always true and that it was the real presence. And I talked about a little earlier, I don't think I quite understood extra ecclesia, no salvation outside the church, and the first law of the church is the salvation of souls, until a little bit later in my life, kind of going into my teenage years. By the time I was like 18, 19, I was pretty hard on it, but I, I hadn't quite jumped to Latin Mass. Seeing the Mass of the Ages, and speaking and, and interacting and living amongst traditional Catholics, I've never asked more people in my life to come to Mass with me who aren't Catholic. And I will give great credit to one of my one of my Calvinist friends. He's gone with me to both the Novus Ordo and to the Latin Mass. Um, and not really much of a reaction after the Novus Ordo. He was like, "All right, cool." It, it was different. I, I did I, I did go to to his service once just to kind of see it. Matter of historical footnote. And um, I was like, "Okay, it's different, right? This this way that they worship is very different, right?" But it. You know, not much. Now I took him to a high mass <laughs> and um, very gracious for him to come. And afterwards he was sitting there thinking and he looked at me and he said, Jordan, I know the difference between Protestants and Catholics. And I said, well, what is it? And he said, well, for Protestants, it's just, it's just water. It's just incense. It's just a wafer. But for Catholics, everything has this meaning behind it and he wasn't saying that the meaning was therefore right but he was just saying like i can tell that you guys ha you believe in your holy water you believe in your incense you believe in in the altar and in the mass and everything everything is there for a reason mm -hmm. now just to experiment another buddy of mine also not a not a catholic not even a christian at the time uh, went with me to to low mass actually just like a weekday low mass if I remember correctly and he too was like impressed with how ancient this felt and he knew he we talked about this and he said you know if I'm if God was God then this would probably be probably akin to the sort of ritual that he would he would probably have and I was like you know what you gonna do he is God <laughs> go figure go figure <laughs> um the last story I'll tell and I love these stories because this is just highlights again like there is we know this too. Latin mass is growing exponentially. There are more people coming. I was just talking to two converts. Um, I'm an usher at my church and I discovered that one of the other ushers, he was a convert and he just, he just somehow just started going to Latin mass. I mean, that's what happened. He just, he heard it and just wanted to, he was, wanted to be there. I find all those stories, a lot of places with traditional Catholics. And I remember once one of the most moving stories, and I wish I knew what happened to her in, again, in West Hollywood, this girl was in front of me, Indian girl. She was wearing sweats and a, and a tank top, uh, not tank top, a uh, hoodie, you know. I could clearly tell that she was lost. She was looking around, not really understanding. So I grabbed my missile and I kind of handed it to her and I pointed out where we were. Hey, we're here, here. Um, and, you know, she like she fought along for a little bit, but I think she was really just taking it in. Uh, her one mistake is that she received communion and I don't think she was not Catholic. But, uh, but she received reverently, so I'm going to let her and God sort that one out. Uh, she didn't fall down dead right there. And I didn't know she was Catholic at the time, otherwise, of course, I would have 
you know, I would have stopped her. But after mass, I caught up with her and I said, hey, like, I want you to know it's really confusing. I'm very new to it myself. Don't feel embarrassed or anything. And I got to talking with her and she had been born a Hindu. Um, she converted, if you will, to Buddhism. Now she was kind of in this general spirituality. And I said, well, that's OK. Well, that's one way. And I asked her, I said, OK, well, what brings therefore someone like that to a Latin mass at seven o'clock at night in West Hollywood? And she goes, well, she goes, there's just this this great energy here. You can feel it. Just it, You could feel it from the walls. And I was like, yeah, well, that's Jesus. <laughs> but even that virtue, even the fact that somebody who wasn't in the faith was of all places to be there at a lot in mass, I think points very powerfully to the beauty that Christ knows about the human heart when it comes to tradition. And so I'm just completely enthralled by the fact that there's so many things about the faith now that make a lot of sense because I'm not fighting against our ancestors actively anymore. I'm not fighting against the church's teaching anymore. And the more the merrier. And that's why I think Latin mass and traditional Catholics and traditional forms of piety and everything are, are growing because, because it does speak very deeply to the human heart. Yeah. Praise be to God. That's it's, it's a fascinating thing to see. I'll never forget going to my first Latin mass yeah, in my first Latin Mass, going and uh, and seeing so many young families, uh, something that I admired, you know, something I wanted to become a father at that time. Thanks be to God, I'm a father now. And, and it was just so surprising to me to see so many young families. Tradition is the future. This is where all of the young people are. And... And uh, I would encourage anyone who is considering uh, tradition, or maybe if you have had a, you know, a doubt about traditionalists, or maybe uh, have encountered, you know, people like that online who are, are very off-putting, I would encourage you, go to a Latin Mass. Go and, and seek out your nearest Latin Mass and, and participate in it. And I, I, I guarantee you, I'm, I'm very confident in saying that I guarantee you, you will find that a lot of the tropes that we discussed today aren't a reality. Most traditionalists are very kind people. They understand um, the, the value of a soul. And I think maybe that's why some traditionalists are very insular some communities are very insular or there isn't a community there sometimes and that's something that we're struggling with here in, in houston there's only basically two options to to go here and uh and you know sometimes there it's not it's not the nature of the mass that makes it insular sometimes here in houston everybody commutes so you have to look at it very objectively and 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 um, I, I think that you're going to fall in love with your faith again if you're struggling. If you have children who are away from the church, they, they don't understand their patrimony. They don't understand what the church is. They don't understand the faith. And I think that they can encounter that in tradition. So I would encourage anyone who is thinking about it to go into a traditional Latin mass and, and figure it out, see what it is, you know. Mm -hmm. Taste the waters. The waters are great. <laughs> oh, beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you, everybody, for, for listening. And if you liked what we had to say, please go ahead. One of the best things we can do is like so we can get more views and more people get interested. And we love your comments, too. We know that we have a ton of listeners who are new to tradition. They've been traditionalists for a little while. Maybe they have questions. You know, there's always, I still have a ton of questions. Um, and so we have a really nice community just down below in the comment section that oftentimes they're able to kind of share their own experiences and tell their own stories. Um, we are very, very grateful to our patrons and our, our sponsors of our channel. If you would like to become a patron, you get some really kind of cool perks, including early episodes. You have the ability to suggest episode topics and even for top tier patrons, we would love to even have you on the show just to discuss your own conversion stories or your reversion stories or what it was like growing up like like I did, a creator Catholic and coming to tradition. So it is down below there if you want to go ahead and, and consider that. 
And the best thing you can do, of course, is to keep Rudy and I in your prayers as well as our families. So until the next time, God bless you and may he keep you. Adios.